was then the UNAVCO steering committee, and I showed up for one of the meetings, and Bill was the only person at the table that I didn't know, so I remember that vividly. <laughs> he comes to us with a bachelor's degree from Arizona University, his PhD from University of Arizona. He did a postdoc in New Zealand, which I didn't know. That was clever. And he's been a faculty member at um, Stony Brook University since 1991. And so please join me in welcoming Bill. Thank you. Thank you, Megan. Uh, thanks for uh, giving me the opportunity to talk. Um, and uh, the subject is very appropriate and basically wouldn't be possible without uh, the existence of the UNAPCO um, facility and the UNAPCO consortium. So what I'm going to talk about today is the uh, development of a tool for detecting and characterizing crustal strain transients. And uh, well, I'd like to acknowledge my co-authors, um, my graduate students that I'm currently working with, Gina Shervenko and uh, UNUMU. And um, I'd also like to uh, give thanks to Rowena Lohman and Jessica Murray and Duncan Agnew for their role in, uh, in uh, developing the SCEC transient detection ex exercise where we all got to uh, test our detection codes and, and uh, perfect them. Well, I'm, they weren't, they're still not perfect, as you'll see, but to test them and uh, collaborate. Okay. I'm not sure the advance is, there we go. Okay, so as I said, uh, we're working on a tool to monitor the plate boundary zone, so to speak, and uh, detect and crustal strain transients on time scales of days to weeks over months and, and strain evolution over even years, and to determine what is statistically significant within that. And we're using the continuous GPS network uh, within the, what is known as PBO. Our goal is to uh, ultimately to get this detection tool established with uh, CSEP. We're working with Masha Lucas and um, okay. So these time series, which are developed or provided by a number of processing centers as part of UNAVCO. And uh, well, what we do is download these time series from the UNAVCO archive on a daily basis. So hopefully, you know, our goal is to have this such that it's an automated procedure. So they're downloaded every day and processed every day and the strain for that day and retrospectively back in time is evaluated. And so we watch the plate boundary zone as it develops in terms of strain and ask the question, is it changing and over what time scale and what is real? What is statistically significant is going to be a, a big question that we're going to be asking. So on the left here is a typical time series of displacement on the vertical axis and time on the horizontal. And what we do is we remove the annual and semi-annual terms. We estimate them, actually, making an oversimplified assumption that the amplitude and uh, the duration is, is, a, is constant. Um, find terms that we remove with constant amplitude. And we're left with a, uh, an estimate of displacement field, and then we apply a, a moving average type filter to that to, to give us an estimate of the continuous displacement field at a particular station as a function of time. And so we have a picture of, of well, down here, another example of a time series that uh, is actually starts right after El Mayor and ends just before the uh, earthquake sequence known as the Brawley sequence. And uh, you can see the seasonal terms here that are removed. And there's a nonlinear component that you know, I'm going to actually talk about that a little bit later in the talk. 
So we get estimates of the displacement field from the UNAVCO time series, from the UNAVCO archive. And from these estimates of the continuous displacement field over time, we can watch the plate boundary zone deform and we interpolate those displacements to come up with estimates of the strain field, the strain deformation field, and how it's evolving over time. So I'll just quickly show you a movie of that. And you can see the displacements. This is over a two-year period. And then contoured is, is a component of the strain field. What's being contoured here is the shear strain rate magnitude associated with pure strike slip style deformation. Um, but what here is expected, you can see the plate motion, of course. Pacific plate is moving uh, in a two year time frame. That's a, a, a total of about 100 millimeters of relative movement displacement relative to uh, the east part over here, which is approaching North America. It's not quite North America frame. Uh, but how much of this is expected and how much of this is anomalous? So we subtract out a reference field, uh, which I'll talk about here in a second. But when you subtract out the reference field, here's an estimate of what is anomalous. Um, the red vectors are from the actual observed time series. The bold are from a model. And we'll talk about the model in a second from a finite element type model where we're modeling those displacements to come up with a, a strain field. We're subtracting out this reference strain field. This is a residual strain field. We want to ask the question is, is that significant? Are these residual displacements and is the residual two-dimensional distribution of these strains, their magnitudes, their orientations, is it significant? Is it real? And is it something that can give us insight into slow slip processes, insight into uh, post seismic processes, which might give you constraints for lower crust rheology, upper mantle rheology? It can give one constraints for quantifying stress changes, stress evolution, stress transfer on to faults as a result of these transient processes. So how do we get these model estimates of the strain field? Um, well, this is a, a grid. It's actually a finite element type grid. The positions of the GPS stations are shown here as little triangles, black triangles. And we interpolate these displacements to come up with an estimate of a continuous displacement field and a continuous strain tensor rotation tensor field. We use spherical treatment, Bevin and Haynes, and we actually come up with this estimate of a continuous solution using a formal least squares type approach where we're solving for this, uh, the, these rotation vector function elements at the corners of these knot points and then interpolating them in between using these bicubic splines. Um, we're minimizing the sum of the squares of the misfit between the observed displacements and that predicted by the model. Now, we do build in some a priori information. We build in information on fault style, the expected orientation. I interpolating displacements to come up with an estimate of the strain tensor field is non-unique. And um, so we build in information about the expected style. The, in other words, the orientation of the faults tell us um, directions of no length change, for example. And if it's a strike slip fault, it, it, it tells us the most likely orientation of, of shear. So we build this information and we do not build in how fast it's slipping or how fast it's straining. 
that has to be dictated by the GPS information. So, um, well, another thing we do is in this fitting procedure, um, how do we regularize it? Uh, how do we achieve a, a smooth yet you know, sufficiently sharp solution where we're, we're matching features? Um, there's one adjustable parameter, uh, like a damping, and, and we adjust that until we achieve a, a reduced chi-squared misfit to all the displacements um, of around one. So um, I'm going to show you, I mentioned the reference field that we subtract out. And uh, the reference field is derived from the USERP 3 velocity field, uh, which is a consensus velocity field built on a long history of, of GPS, both campaign and, and continuous efforts. Of course, the PBO velocity field is part of this. Um, there's, there are measurements uh, coming from NASA, uh, JPL, uh, the measures processing, Pacific Northwest, uh, campaign type data from RPI, MIT, um, data from the, the SCEC cross uh, motion model, the Canadian Backbone Network, um, the North American Reference Frame Solution, UCLA processing of the Western US, University of Nevada, Reno, and uh, USGS Western US uh, analyses. So, this consensus velocity field um, is, is a really nice thing. Uh, this was given to me by, uh, by Tom Herring. So let me just show you a zoom in of this just GPS velocity field in a Pacific frame of reference. Um, and uh, there it is. Let me show you the model fit to that. Here's the model fit. So this is the continuous velocity field plotted out at the GPS stations. Um, again, this is in a Pacific frame of reference. And here are the residuals. So we're fitting the data, the model, this continuous model uh, that has a rigid Pacific plate, spherical cap in it, um, is, is fitting the GPS data really well. So what does the strain field look like? Well, here it is. Um, so this is part of the model reference field that we're going to subtract out from our time-dependent estimates that come from the GPS. And it has a lot of features in it that are really interesting and nice. I mean, it has the major obvious uh, strike-slip shear zone that's the San Andreas. The principal axes of, of strain are shown here. The bold are compressional. The open arrows are extensional. And um, this contoured component is the magnitude of pure strike-slip deformation. So I'm going to talk about this, this reference field a little bit. Um, here's the, 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 the shear component that is uh, obviously showing this main feature here that we know uh, and love, uh, the San Andreas and, and the San Jacinto. Uh, so this guy really stands out um, in the shear strain rate component or shear strain component. And in fact, well, I have a lot of confidence in this solution. Why? Um, we've done a lot of benchmarking exercises where we have known models of fault slip rate, particular locking depth, Okada type models. We generate a displacement field. Using this algorithm of fitting displacements, we estimate the strains and then compare them with the analytic output of Okada's routine. We've done this under a number of scenarios and using the station spacing of PBO. And we've done this and found that we can recover these strain fields very accurately with very minimal artifacts. So we have a lot of confidence in, the, in, in how reliably we're, we're recovering the spatial distribution of the true uh, orientation of this long, this is a longer term snapshot, let's say about a 10 year, 15 year period that, we're, that has been measured by multiple different researchers embedded in this USER velocity field. Uh, I mean, one thing we actually do is we estimate the fault slip rate and locking depth using the shear component. The reason we do this is we think that there's a lot of off-fault deformation that's not related to the locking on that major strike slip fault. That off-fault deformation, you could say, is contaminating. It's embedded in the horizontal velocity field, but we don't want to use that. 
when we invert for a locking depth and slip rate. So in a sense, this is a way of filtering out features of the deformation field that are not linked with that locking. And so if we invert the shear strain rate component associated with pure strike, strike slip deformation, we're in a sense isolating that part of the deformation field that is associated with the locking of this major strike slip fault. So we invert for slip rate, locking depth, and the actual position of the fault itself. And here's one result uh, for this section along the Mojave. In fact, here are estimates all the way along. Some of these are um, agree with the geology, and some actually don't. Um, but for what it's worth, the slip rates are shown here, um, and their locking depths, which are coming up shallow, shallower than some previous estimates, are shown in parentheses. Okay, so I hear some grumbling about some of these results, maybe you can talk to me afterwards. But I'm just showing the reference field here. And well, having estimated that part of the deformation field associated with the strike slip faulting, we can then estimate what is occurring off of the major fault. And this is a major, this is a, a big initiative of the USERV 3 effort. Uh, is to determine and quantify how much deformation is occurring off the faults. So we actually estimate an off-fault deformation, um, a total tectonic moment rate for the area, and we estimate as much as 30% of the moment rate is occurring off of the major faults. Um, and I was actually pleased to hear uh, from Kai Johnson that this agreed with the value that he was getting uh, using um, viscoelastic type modeling of, of, again, using GPS and matching the GPS data. But using a very different technique, he came up with this number. And as I understand, other researchers are coming up with this sort of ballpark number. So it's good confirmation to use a different method and um, get some agreement. So now let's get back to the dependent, time dependent behavior of the plate boundary zone. And what I'm going to do is. Um, focus in on a number of areas. Our goal is to really monitor the whole plate boundary zone over time. On, like I said, on time scales of days to weeks to months and, and how it's evolved over uh, time scales of years. So again, here's some time series down in the south. Um, and in particular, one thing I'm going to talk about today is the post seismic feature, that anomalous strain associated with El Mayor. We're really in the, we're north of that rupture, which occurred uh, right about in here, I believe, maybe off, but the El Mayor event occurred here. And the G GPS stations are, in this case, are situated to the north of it. So how much of this is real and statistically significant? Our procedure tests the null hypothesis that this time-dependent strain field inferred from the continuous GPS is equivalent to the long-term steady state solution I just showed you. And we use the T statistic as this test, simple statistic, where here in the top the numerator, this is the second invariant of the tensor differences between our time-dependent strain field that we determine and the reference strain field. And this is the standard error of those, the formal standard error of those differences, which we get in, out of our inversion. So when we invert the GPS data with some a priori information, we get an, a formal a posteriori uncertainty in the model estimates of strain. Um, so let me show you a map of when, when, the, when that ratio is greater than two, then the strain differences between that inferred from the GPS and that from the reference model, which is a longer term deformation field, it is significant. Those differences are significantly different at more than the 95% confidence. That we simply plotted as a little yellow star here. So 
with those differences, at, at, they're significant at the 95% confidence level, uh, and then we actually have that contoured. So there are three areas that show up as interesting, containing interesting transients. Now, this is a retrospective look at what evolved between right after El Mayor and right before Brawley. And we're targeting that time frame because we're interested in the stress evolution after El Mayor leading up to Brawley. And, uh, but over that two-year time scale, there are three areas that show up that contain significant transients, the evolution of what may be transient behavior. I mean, down here, obvious. Um, I'm going to talk first about this one here, Los Angeles Basin area. We see, well, okay, I, it, there's a distribution of uh, significant strain, anomalous strain. It differs from our reference field. We need to look into this more. I don't know what this is, but I found it interesting when we had a workshop at the SCEC meeting. Um, actually, the SCEC special meeting, the, the uh, community geodetic, ge geodetic model meeting, community stress model meeting in May uh, in Menlo Park, um, I met um, uh, Jen Liu, and he talked about using INSAR, how they've looked at 17 years of data um, from INSAR, and they see long-term re um, persistent reoccurring anomalies in, in using the INSAR method in the Santa Ana Basin region and also the Antelope Valley area. And uh, these are variations do, uh, associated with long-term water extraction. Um, and I think, I suspect, although we need to confirm it, that this is what we're picking up, perhaps, that with the GPS. So even over a two-year time scale, we may be picking up what you could describe as volume sources. So it's not just tectonic features that we may be picking up. Hopefully, we're isolating something that's really related to crustal deformation, but that may be associated with something like hydrologic features. The second area I'm going to talk about and focus in on is down here in the south, and that's the evolution after El Mayor leading up to uh, the Brawley Swarm. So I showed you this already, but let me show you it again. This is the evolution of the displacement field and the model residual estimates of strength. The contours are the magnitude of the strike slip part. And so you can see that over this two-year time frame, down here, this is the year 2011, uh, and we're moving in 0.1-year time increments. Again, the difference between the reference model and this displacement from the time series is the red vector. And that coming from the inversion is this bold vector. This is 95% confidence. So what's interesting about the evolution of this field is it's actually pretty complicated. Um, th there are displacements very far to the north, uh, uh, up in the area that um, constitutes the, the volume surrounding the uh, 1992 Landers sequence and the 99 Hector Mine sequence. That area is experiencing residual displacements that differ from the reference model um, and, and a fairly complicated field. And then we see residual strains uh, uh, distributed throughout. And, the, and apparently these are statistically significant. So to really understand this, you have to link this with a dynamic model. But what's coming out of this is potentially a spatial distribution of the deformation field that is maybe more complex than we would expect. It's heterogeneous. It's focusing on particular areas. Um, and, um, well, we need to do further tests to, to look at the reliability of this. Um, I could get into that in more detail, but let me show you the evolution of the strain tensor differences right after El Mayor leading up to Brawley. And in particular, what you're going to see in, is the evolution in this area, or I'd like to point out, I should say, the evolution in this area, but also along the southern part of the San Andreas, which is kind of curious. Let me show you this. Again, the bold axis is the 
compressional and at the open is extensional. Um, so a big shear component building here. I'm contouring this pure strike clip component of the shear as this movie develops. Time, 2012. So look in this area. The shear component is getting bigger. A big opening here. And so right before Brawley, what we see is a little bit of a rotation of the extension axes growing in, in dimension or growing in magnitude of that, of that residual strain and, and uh, serving to unclamp the uh, fault plane that eventually broke, producing the, the t t sequence of earthquakes that was, that was Brawley. The other thing we see is an evolution of strain that seems to be focusing along the southern San Andreas. But what's interesting about this is that that strain that's developing, that residual strain, is actually in left lateral sense. Um, now, that doesn't mean that left lateral shear took place along the southern part of the San Andreas. It's just that you could think of it another way, that during this post-seismic period, the southern San Andreas is not accumulating a lot of right lateral strike slip motion or strain. And so when you subtract out the reference field, you have this residual. Now, why is that? I don't know. The San Jacinto, on the other hand, we see the development of normal accumulation of right lateral slip. This is the dilatational component. Again, a big opening that developed here. So I'm going to sh provide a summary of what we see for, for, for El, El Mayor post-seismic from the monitoring of the continuous. One is that's surprising, and I don't understand the physics of it, and this is what would take more detailed dy dynamic modeling, specific modeling dynamics. Um, the southern San Andreas experiences a reduced rate of right lateral strike slip during this two-year time frame after El Mayor, whereas San Jacinto what we see is it's just continuing to load and, develop, and, and it's got this right lateral motion. But I think the spatial distribution of what we're picking up on the southern San Andreas is, is, is potentially real. Before the Brawley swarm, the state, state of strain evolves south of Salton Trough to enable unclamping of the left lateral fault that eventually did rupture. That's interesting too in terms of stress evolution which we need to quantify. The Laguna Salada Fault, or the, northern, the northernmost segment of that, or the southernmost part of the Elsinore, uh, has a big right lateral strike slip component. That's this guy in here. So I mentioned that our goal is to quantify these strain transients and, and using a variety of ways to understand rheology of the crust and slow slip processes stress transfer. Um, just for interest, I'm going to zoom up to, and we are presently working to monitor the whole plate boundary zone, including basin and range where transients are expected to be very subtle and small, potentially long wavelength as well. That's another story. Uh, but let's look at the uh, Cascadia area. And obviously here, um, starting with Megan work, and with her colleagues, Panga Network, um, and all the work that happened since then, these episodic tremor and slip events have been characterized in great detail. Our automated technique is picking these things up, of course. So I'd like to show you one movie of the dilatational component. And one thing that stands out by looking at the strain evolution and the overlying plate in, above this subduction zone is that an interesting strain field develops that recurs over and over again during these ETS events. So let me point that out. Let me show you the movie. This is the residual displacement. Again, the residual strain is being plotted as the dilatational component, and these things are way statistically significant. This is going in small time steps. And here is the transient as it develops. same thing as before. It lasts about a month, and then it dies out, and you see the vector differences go to zero. That means everything is copacetic or happening like you expect during the, 
the rest of the time frame. So you can watch these movies, uh, you know, as they evolve over years, and then you can see the transients coming and going, and then it's kind of boring for a long, long time, and then they come and go. Um, but what you see when you look at them over and over, this 2007, 2008, 2009, 2010, 2011, they all have a similar pattern. They differ somewhat, and we've looked at this all up and down uh, the subduction zone, and they all have a characteristic feature. But these two lobes of dilatation I find interesting. They uh, recur with a zone of compression in between that seems to correspond roughly with the topography. Um, we've yet to model this uh, and look into whether others have seen this, but I think it might provide a constraint for slow slip processes, in particular the magnitude of slip is changing along dip here. So that's something that we need to look into more. But I thought it was interesting to show you. The next part of the talk is um, very briefly uh, wave gradiometry. And I, I find this fascinating. It's basically taking a lot of the techniques I just spoke about uh, and looking instead of over days and weeks and years looking at strain evolution, you look at the strain evolution of, of wave fields that emanate from earthquakes. Uh, this could be applied to uh, high-rate GPS networks, but it's also applicable to uh, something like U.S. Array. And we use the U.S. Array data right now. Um, this is the position of U.S. Array at the time of the great March 11, 2011 Japan earthquake. And uh, we just treat this as a geodetic network. Uh, we take the horizontal displacements and the vertical displacements, and we model them as a function of time to estimate the strain embedded in the wave field. And it turns out, as I'm going to summarize here, you can directly solve a wave equation doing this. And you can solve directly for structural parameters of, of uh, phase velocity. You can solve for the structural phase velocity of the upper mantle and, and crust um, by doing this. So here's a nice little movie. It's going to start out, uh, again, the red vector is the observed uh, position, displacement estimates, horizontal. And the bold vector superimposed on that is the predict, that predicted by the model interpolation. So we're interpolating these fields to estimate this continuous strain field. So it starts out, you're going to see the love wave coming in. And then it's a beautiful evolution as that love wave moves through, and then you see the Rayleigh wave come in. Now, these are similar to what IRIS provides. They have these, in fact, we got the idea by watching the IRIS movies. Um, and they have these beautiful movies of the displacement magnitudes. So there it is. There's the love wave coming in from the Great Japan Earthquake. And then you see this very interesting evolution of the displacement field as the Rayleigh wave comes in with the obvious magnitude differences. Okay, well, let's look at the shear strain component. So again, the, just like I showed earlier, here's the bold. The bold is the compressional strain at a given time. The extension is the extensional strain. Or sorry, the open vector is the extensional strain. And um, what you're going to see here, what we're contouring back behind that is the dilatational component. So when the love wave's coming through, you're going to see this, these strain axes as though it's strike slip vaulting. <laughs> And then um, what you're going to see is as the Rayleigh wave comes in, then the, 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 uh, the dilatational strains really kick in. Because the dilatation is associated with the Rayleigh wave, you know, retrograde elliptical motion of ground. The, the, the dilatational strains come in. So you can see that in this strain evolution movie. Oh, by the way, the time is down here. This is the time after the earthquake. So here comes the Rayleigh wave with the larger dilatational strains and the principal axes oriented more um, in the direction of wave propagation. And here's the shear component. Contours, the pure 
clip component of the displacement field embedded in the wave field that are recorded by US Array. Now, what's, what good is this? And this is, excites me because um, from this, in a, sense, in a sense, geodetically inferred displacement field, I, I mean, for the first time, we're able to now, because of these sensor networks, measure the shape of wave fields as they move through. That's something traditionally in seismology, although it's been addressed over the last decade or more. I don't think it's really been approached, although the Colorado group is doing this now. Um, but it hasn't been approached in great detail because never before have we had these dense networks. But um, so what can we do with this? Um, this is the technique of gradiometry, which has been championed by, by Langston and developed by Langston uh, recently in the literature. So the displacement field, um, G is, is the amplitude information uh, through space, and F is the wave function that contains phase information as a function of time and, and, and wave slowness. So if we take the spatial derivative of that displacement field, you get this relationship, and that there's a compatibility relationship between the spatial gradients, which we're determining. Those movies I showed you are the spatial gradients of the wave field. So there's a relationship between the spatial gradients and the uh, displacement. There's a compatibility relationship between them, between the, the spatial gradients and the displacement and the velocity, particle velocity and linked through these two coefficients that were active. So we determine these spatial gradients, and then we actually, and, we, and you know from the seismogram, the displacement and the, and the velocity, seismogram, so we actually invert for these coefficients. Now, what are they? They contain valuable information. This one is the changes in geometric spreading and also radiation, and this is the wave slowness. Now, that wave slowness, it turns out to be the, um, dynamic phase velocity, as described by uh, Wieland. But it also turns out that this coefficient, we recently discovered, is the gradient of logarithmic amplitude, which, if you can get it, it will enable you to directly solve the wave equation or solve the Helmholtz equation. So that's what we do. I mean, just very quickly, here's a Rayleigh waveform. We apply what's called a reducing velocity method, where we shift the wave field relative to a master station, determine the spatial gradients from that, and then we're solving for, inverting for, the perturbation and slowness that will um, give you this compatible strain, associated with this strain field. So we solve iteratively. Um, and you can see that as you're approaching the true value of the slowness, you update the slowness, shift the waveforms again. Those spatial gradients of those waveforms, convert those again for these wave parameters, the A and B coefficients. We do this over and over to come up with a final estimate of the dynamic slowness. Then you get other really cool things. You get, because this A coefficient that I showed you, which is, the log of the, it's the, it's the gradient of the logarithmic amplitude of the wave field. When you have that together with the Laplacian of the logarithmic amplitude, you have the direct solution to the Helmholtz equation. So with that, you get the small correction or correction to the dynamic phase velocity that gives you the structural phase velocity. So this is that actual field, it's how they look. Um, the vectors are the gradient of logarithmic amplitude. This is an event that came up from Chile um, out of the south. And so you have these, these gradients of logarithmic amplitude are roughly orthogonal to the ray path of, of these waves as they move up. And so there, there's valuable information contained in this, in this. And this is all coming out of being able to estimate the spatial gradients of the wave field. Um, and so that's the Laplacian. That's the actual second derivative that's being contoured there. So this would correspond to amplitude highs and amplitude lows, uh, the red color. And these are associated with heterogeneity within the lithosphere. So we're using this technique, we're inverting it and coming up with 
phase velocity estimate just very quickly to show you one picture. This is for a uh, period band between 100 and 125 seconds. And actually, this is from a test from, of synthetic data uh, from the Princeton uh, portal where they provide full wave field synthetics that are determined using a, a beautiful uh, code uh, called spec sound 3 d globe. And so we're inverting those. In a sense, this is like a blind test because uh, we're not exactly sure what phase velocity information they put in. And what we still need to do is verify this model estimate of the phase velocity with what they put into their model. So we're doing that with the synthetics as a test. We're actually applying this to real data. So I just wanted to show you that because it's related to something that's certainly linked with uh, geodesy. And uh, oh, OK, so here's some quick conclusions. So the, the point is there's this compatibility relation between the spatial gradients of the wave field, which you can now get because you have a US array or with high rate GPS sensors. As these wave fronts come through, you can determine the spatial gradients. And this compatibility enables one to recover important wave field attributes, including wave slowness, dynamic wave slowness, back azimuth of that energy, and changes in geometrical spreading. Now, it turns out that this change in geometric spreading is actually relinked with that gradient and log amplitude. Now, so you can get the Laplacian and then directly solve the Helmholtz, which is exciting. And so I think there's a big future there. I didn't time it here. Um, the last part, very quickly, um, is I wanted to talk about Coors Network. And this is also exciting. UNAPCO is now providing Coors Network solutions. Um, and this was a, a study conducted by a postdoc that was working with me last year. And we got hit pretty hard by this hurricane, Sandy. Um, and after the hurricane, um, that's my house. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm glad that's not my house. Uh, we were on the North Shore, so we, were, we, we did okay. We were without power for about eight or nine days. Um, I found out what it's like to, to uh, have to worry about generators and gasoline lines that are a mile long. Um, but yeah, a lot of people suffered from this. But Jin Hai, um, after the hurricane, approached me and said, hey, we should use GPS data and look at the data. And is there going to be anything in it? And knowing, you know, this is how you make discovery. You just look at, look at these things, and you, you, you never know, right? Um, so I told him about the Coors Network, and in particular about Jeff Blewett solutions that he was providing at that time, and he still is providing, these five-minute solutions. From, and, and there's so many Coors stations, you just have a lot of data. Some of it's lousy. But there's a lot of high-quality stations in there, from what I understand from Jeff. So we looked at the data, and um, he produced, it was basically, he, he did something similar to what I've described. He, he looked at the days leading up to the hurricane, during the hurricane, and then after. Um, in fact, the, the hurricane I path is shown here, making landfall around 2100 Universal Standard Time. And the storm surge heights above normal are contoured here, roughly during the peak time. OK, so, and the core stations that we used are shown as these little triangles. So one thing we noted is that around the time that it made landfall, the vertical component showed a big, whopping vertical displacement, as much as 10 centimeters, which is huge. Hard to understand. Uh, and we see this on a lot of stations. So what he did is he made a movie. Let me see if I got that. No, OK. The next slide I'm going to show you is all of this displacement projected onto this profile, starting here at A and ending at B. And he plotted this like you would plot a seismogram. The red is up relative to 
to the mean average, and the blue is down. The hurricane made landfall, and the storm surge reached its peak in time. This is the vertical axis is time, right about here. So as the storm surge is making its peak, there seems to be, close to the coastline, a lot of stations. If you look at that, you could say, almost looks like a reflection, okay? But it turns out that this feature is about a five-hour period from when it goes up, when he thinks of peak amplitude, to when it goes down and then back up. This is about five hours. Here's a movie. So this is the vertical displacement contoured. The bright red is about 10 centimeters. The dark blue is around 10 centimeters. So here's the eye. You see a large area going up, and then you see a big down movement that happens as the storm surge is peaking, which we found very interesting. There's also a lot of other anomalies that aren't, I mean, it's just bad stations. But if you look at the whole spatial distribution here, let me show it again, or try to. Go back. Okay. If you look at this spatial distribution along the coast here, there's a large area that's impacted. So there's a big up going on right now, a big up, and now here comes the down. And it seems to propagate in and then back up again, a rapid rebound. It, but it's that long period of down that is right here. And we've looked at this over and over and looked back at the data. And now, we're fortunately, we're working with the expert, Jeff Blewett, to really address and look back at this data and ask the question, how much of this is an atmospheric phenomenon and how much of this might be real physical phenomenon associated with loading, the loading from this uh, storm surge. And I showed you the map of the spatial distribution of the storm surge. One possible hypothesis is this massive mound of water, and this has been modeled before, it's been observed before, particularly the North Sea, big storm surges do depress the land surface. And we've actually modeled this. We put this load in and looked at the, what the land response is. What's enigmatic is we see, yes, we see a downward depression of the land, a flexure, um, using Farrell's equations, of the land surface in response to load, but what we see is something of order one and a half centimeters, not 10 centimeters. So it's a bit, a bit of a problem explaining the amplitude that we see, whether this is real or not, or how much of this is atmospheric. But what's interesting is exactly arriving with that downward movement is the arrival of the big storm surge. And spatially, the downward movement is centered around that storm surge, inland from the storm surge. The, the actual tides are, these are a number of stations along the Long Island coast and Connecticut coastline, uh, the Battery, New York, and so on. Um, the red is the actual tide observed uh, heights, and um, the, the, this is the expected. So the anomaly, the actual anomalous load, uh, is the green. And so you see whopping big um, amplitude up to uh, four meters of amplitude uh, associated, associated with this storm surge. That's a massive load of water, and uh, well, one hypothesis is that this may be uh, related to um, the loading. And in other words, the thing we see in Coors Network, we may have picked up a very long wavelength wave uh, that is being excited by um, uh, the Hurricane Sandy storm surge loading. But you know what we're looking into now, and Jeff is reprocessing this, is how much of this could be associated with tropospheric moisture phenomenon and so on. So he has a plan. I'm grateful for that to look into this. Um, we see uh, a propagation of this wave field moving at subsonic speeds, um, 50 to 100 meters per second, which is really hard to understand. Um, you would expect to see just a, a static loading and displacement of the crust, but we think we actually see this thing propagating and uh, in particular, Jin Hai thinks we're looking at slow wave phenomena. And there's a whole field of wave phenomena, wave fields that can travel subsonic. They're really hard to understand. Um, but uh, 
I'll, I'll leave it at that, and I'll just say the physics of that is really complicated, what the propagation flow is. So what this thing ends with a period of five hours, um, you got me. And maybe you guys have some answers. I'm actually going to stop here. That's it. Goodbye. The only way it could be, okay, so here we're in this time frame, it hasn't made landfall and the storm surge is barely built. And, and you see the land going up. So as the low pressure moves in, the land should actually be going up. As the low pressure encroaches on the land, that loading is actually going to cause the land to want to go up. But instead what we see is a sudden down. Okay, that's the downward pulse of what we think is maybe a wave in order for that to be delay, it would mean that the, moist, the, the component that's in the atmosphere is coming in at this time frame only. Right in here is where the tropospheric, I don't know that this is significant up here. This is significant, I believe. This downward movement is significant. Well, <laughs> it shows up. Let me just put it that way. Um, that would mean that this is when the delay is taking place, but not before and not after. So it makes, when, when, the, when the eye makes landfall, um, things actually start to settle down. So as the storm surge is receding, things really are settling down. Now here's where things really take off, but here's where the delay comes in, and now delay's gone. But look, this thing's moving in. Where did all the rain fall? I don't understand upper atmosphere dynamics. Where did the rain fall? I do know that. The rain was in the south. The rain was all down here. It was almost dry, almost bone dry up here where we see the big down movement. So that this thing's circulating around counterclockwise and um, it would mean that the upper atmosphere phenomenon up here didn't involve rain, I know that. Um, but it only lasts during this time period just prior to landfall. Let me just put it, it only lasts while the storm surge is peaking. As soon as the storm surge starts to recede, it actually starts to rebound quickly. It actually rebounds really quick. So down now, and it just barely makes landfall when it's popped back up and settling down. But that's a, that's a long time period there. That, that's a critical five hours. But it's during that critical five hours, really about eight hours, the storm surge is reaching its peak and then completely gone. This is different stations. So what this is, is this is A and this is B. So A, he's, what he did is he projected these stations he, he, yes, these are the stations we're looking at within this window here. And so the big downs, the big downs are on Long Island and the north coast of, uh, of Connecticut. This is where the real big down movement is, is basically where my cursor is circling. This is the big down movement. It attenuates, the downward motion is attenuated. By the time you get out here, it's pretty small. If you look at these guys projected on uh, up in your Finger Lakes area, you, you could argue that that's not significant at all. I mean, it's within this amplitude range. But this, this, a lot of these down movements, and I'll show you one prior to that. That's, that's one there. That's what they look like. Okay, so 
Yeah, the right half seemed to be significant. So that's 300 kilometers in. So let's look back at our map. 300 kilometers in from this edge. So um, how long is the profile? It's 600, so half, half the length. So right to about here. So you could argue that all these, which is about when we look at, we use Duncan Agnew's code Spottel. I mean, that's about where you see the, the limit of the downward depression. It's just that we're seeing much higher amplitudes of that downward depression. So how far up? Oh, we, this is 10 centimeters, and Spottle predicted about a centimeter and a half. So uh, Jinhai thinks it's a resonance phenomenon, which he's trying to, he's actually got finite element models of it. But so you have an amplification going on, which is really weird. It's propagating. It seems to propagate. So there's a, it's, a, it's not a static load, it's a dynamic feature. Okay. Yeah. That's a great question. And um, I, I think that, I, I, okay, first of all, to answer your question, we're, it's our goal to have look at this in great detail by now, but we're looking into it now. I have a student looking at the Great Basin time series and looking for the long wavelength anomalies that were described by Davis and Wernicke and others, they claim there are long wavelength transients in the Great Basin. They hypothesize these are linked to a very large mega detachment. So these are big. And um, we're con actually working with them. And they're looking at the time series and they claim they do see it. So we're trying to come at it from a different angle using a very different technique. So Davis's group now sees these things continuing. Um, getting really big, to give you away, uh, here on the east side. So they saw a big transients on the west side. You know, guess what big is now? Two, two millimeters, okay? That's big. But they see a spatially correlated two millimeter changes over time scales of two to three years. Yeah, and so, but now we're seeing big ones over here on the east. So we're, we're coming at it using our technique or this, and we hope to have results in the next week or two. I was hoping to have it for this talk, but no. Um, so they're, they're expected to be small. We're looking for long wavelength features. What concerns me is something like reservoir loading, and I'm interested in Chuck Merton's work with uh, your colleagues, and basically they are, you guys are, are putting in the load. You're putting in hydrologic loads. You have estimates of, of how much snow and so on, and you're putting in the expected elastic response from that. And I think the next step is to deconvolve that from the signal and to try and isolate what might truly be tectonic, maybe associated with a mega detachment. Exactly. Not obvious, yeah. I mean, if you look at the time series, you just can't see it. So that's where this kind of tool comes in, where spatial correlations, I mean, that's the strength of interpolating with splines, is you're pulling out information that's spatially correlated and temporally correlated. That's, and, and it allows you to pull these things out a little bit and make them more, well, if they're there, they're going to be more obvious, hopefully.
Uh, no, we're not. We're not. We have the vertical and the seismogram, but not in the crustal zone. Yes. Yeah, I think um, the vertical is a big one for understanding hydrologic loading, right, Chuck? Yeah. So, yeah. So, um, no, we're not including the vertical, just the horizontal. And, uh, but if you want to pull out phenomena associated with hydrologic, yeah, the vertical is going to be important. Welcome.